Hello. This is my second video on Sir Francis Bacon, later Lord St. Albans, this one dealing with his epistemology. A third video will deal with his vision of science. Bacon sought to take all knowledge to be my province, and outlined a framework for the whole of knowledge and human inquiry, comprising history, poesy, and philosophy, expressing the three fundamental faculties of the mind, memory, imagination, and reason. But it was philosophy, including Baconian science, which he elevated over the other two, seeing history as the mere accumulation of facts, and literature as only imaginative illustration. For him, learning could only advance if the prestige of philosophy, particularly natural philosophy or science, was increased. Bacon published substantive essays on science, including his Silver Silvarum, a natural history in ten centuries, a compilation of hundreds of scientific observations and speculations on a wide variety of topics. He also included discussions of the natural histories of phenomena such as life and death and the winds in his great instauration, and outlined a complex series of meta-scientific ideas and theories. Most of this substantive and speculative work has long been forgotten, however. By contrast, his work on the epistemology of science and his vision of its nature and significance have been of lasting importance and have shaped the development of what we might term the modern scientific project. In his work on epistemology, Bacon described two interlocking themes, the unsatisfactory nature of contemporary learning and his proposed new tool or method of research. These are both referred to in his 1592 letter to Lord Burley, but are described in far more detail in The Advancement of Learning in 1605, The Novum Organum of 1620, and The De Dignitate of 1623. Bacon viewed contemporary learning as totally unsatisfactory. Central here was his rejection of the whole scholastic tradition as taught in the universities of the time. For Bacon, scholasticism was a massive barrier to understanding the world as it was. But there were also other barriers which prevented people from gaining an accurate or complete understanding of nature, some like scholasticism, deriving from reliance on book learning, but others reflecting the natural tendencies of the human mind. Indeed, true philosophers had to be aware that the mind itself created barriers to genuine learning, and as part of their endeavour to understand the world, they had to identify the idols and vanities of the mind and avoid them. Writing poetically, Bacon identified four idols of the mind, the idolamentis. These were the idols of the tribe, the cave, the marketplace, and the theatre. The idols of the tribe were the natural tendency we all shared for the human mind to move from what it knew to what it did not know. Thus we relied uncritically on our senses, rushed to premature judgments, believed what we would like to be true, assumed uniformity and similarity where none existed, for example applying old perspectives in new situations where they might not be relevant, and imagined an imposed order on what we experienced when it might merely be random. The idols of the cave varied from one person to another and reflected the particular prejudices and distortions which we each acquired from our education, training, social customs, and individual experiences. We cherished these understandings, unaware that they might be only strange and absurd fancies derived from our own narrow world. The idols of the marketplace were those which derived from language, such as the terms for imaginary things, which we then assumed existed, like the supposed crystalline spheres of Aristotelian Ptolemaic cosmology, or misleading terms for things which did not exist. Our understanding of the world was shaped by the language we used to describe it, but we were often unaware that language could create false knowledge and representations of the world. The advancement of knowledge therefore required the right and careful use of language to avoid its possible distortions. Finally, the idols of the theatre derived from grand philosophical systems which were not based securely on experimental evidence, 
These were intellectual constructs which looked impressive, like a well-produced theatre production, but lacked real substance. These included the following. Those which were based mostly, or entirely, on abstract argument and speculation, as with the scholasticism of Bacon's day. Those which were based on a key insight or limited research, but were then overgeneralized to apply more widely, as with the work of Bacon's older contemporary, William Gilbert, in which magnetism was seen as a pervasive force behind almost all earthly phenomena, and those which mixed philosophy with theological concerns, as with the systems of Pythagoras and Plato, or Bacon's contemporaries who sought to base natural philosophy on Genesis or the Book of Job. Elsewhere, Bacon referred to the three vanities or distempers of learning, the fantastical ideas of occultists and others that appealed to credulous people, and which were not based on any evidence, and were carefully protected from any external criticism, the vain altercations of scholasticism with its quibbling debates, and the delicate learning of those humanists who were concerned with only the exact phrasing of classical texts rather than their substantive content. These vanities diverted great minds from productive inquiry to trivial and talent-wasting pursuits, and rather than leading to the discovery of new knowledge, served only to foster self-serving pride. As to Bacon's new tool of scientific research, his Novum Organum, this was rigorous inductive empiricism. That is, first, that the true basis of knowledge was the natural world and the information it provided through the human senses so that pursuit of knowledge had to begin with the unbiased analysis of concrete data. Then, and only then, could the philosopher-scientist reason inductively to reach general, empirically-based conclusions. In so doing, however, it was essential that he proceeded cautiously. At each stage, well-designed experiments should be devised to test, refine, and frame ideas, and no generalization should be accepted that had not been tested. Of course, Aristotle had based many of his original scientific ideas on careful observation of phenomena, but for Bacon, Aristotle had lacked rigor in testing the generalizations he had made from the evidence and had relied too much on logical syllogisms rather than continuing observation. The result was that he had created deductive chains of reasoning which were easily destroyed by the discovery of contrary instances. By contrast, Baconian induction required that each successive stage of a generalization be carefully tested before the next. For Bacon, the process of generalization was like constructing a ladder and only when a lower level intermediate generalization had been thoroughly confirmed was it possible to construct the one above it. Of course, in practice, Bacon's system was not an adequate model of scientific inquiry. The researcher still had to decide at what point he had made sufficient observations to justify making a generalization, and there were no obvious rules to determine when that decision should be made. Again, in practice, the early modern scientists of the 17th century, men like Kepler, Galileo, and Harvey, all relied on careful observation to support their views. But their key ideas, the elliptical movements of the planets, the laws of motion, the functioning of the circulatory system, were developed as a result of their intuitive and imaginative understanding of the data that they had rather than mere generalization. It was not that they rejected the inductive method, only that in the science they actually did, their results were not based only on induction. They, as also modern-day scientists, used inductive reasoning, but they did not use it alone. They shared Bacon's insistence on careful collection and reconfirmation of data and explanatory frameworks, but they were not bound tightly by his model. As William Harvey, Bacon's younger contemporary and best remembered for his work on the circulation of the blood, quipped, Bacon had written of natural philosophy like a Lord Chancellor rather than an actual practitioner. 
This is not to dismiss Bacon's epistemological work. His description of the inductive method may have been naive and unrealistic, but his emphasis on rigorous inquiry based on empirical data was fundamental to the scientific revolution of his day and provided a philosophical legitimacy and rationale for what other scientists were beginning to do. Bacon's insistence that science could not progress through reliance on traditional authority was also of enormous importance and highly influential. There was no place for dogmatic statements based on tradition, religion, or deductive reasoning. For those who accepted his ideas, the notion that something was true simply because some wise man had said it in the past was a bad principle. There had to be empirical support for any generalization about the nature of the world. Thank you for listening. In the next video we'll turn to Bacon's vision of science.